sounds like it's time to start <laughs> if the recording started. Okay, great. Um, thanks for everyone's patience while we waited for a couple more people to join. Uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, we're excited to have this group to talk about data analysis and qualitative marine sustainability research. And in this session, uh, we're introducing and practicing the method of flexible coding, which we hope you'll find useful as you consider analysis for your own work. Um, so Seen and I are the organizers today and we'll just briefly introduce ourselves um, my name is Liliana Bastian. I'm a final year PhD student in marine social sciences and human geography. Um, and then I'm also a postdoctoral research associate on the SMMR project, Resilience of Coastal Communities. Hmm? Thanks, Liliana. Yeah, so I'm Sim van der Plunk. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Exeter, um, working on the Resilience of Coastal Communities project. And more generally, I'm an environmental social scientist who's spent a lot of recent years studying different coastal, I guess, changes and hazards and climate change on the coast. Yeah, so um, we are working in collaborative qualitative research um, with teams of two or three coders in the ROC project. And we found that we needed a systematic way to conduct and manage that qualitative analysis. And so we're um, meeting today to build capacity in SMMR for qualitative coding and also to learn from other experiences. So we really welcome um, in your input from your own experience or your questions and discussion um, throughout the session. Um, okay, so just a quick overview of what to expect today. We're gonna spend um, the first about 10 minutes on an introduction, reviewing learning objectives, um, and then we'll spend about 20 minutes on flexible coding. So what is flexible coding, why we might use it and how to do it. Um, we're then gonna go into breakout sessions of group, uh, groups of three or four and do some coding practice. So we'll use um, sample research questions to create a code book and um, practice coding on our sample transcript. Uh, we'll then discuss and reflect on that experience, have a quick five minute break, and then um, go back into breakouts to do a little bit more coding, the second step in the flexible coding process. Um, we'll then talk about that again in, in a discussion um, and then end with a couple of strategies for managing collaboration um, and distributing coding work among a team of people before we close. So before we get started in sharing how we've been using flexible coding in the Resilience of Coastal Communities project. We also wanted to find out a bit more about what brought you to this session. Um, I guess we're wondering, and you can put this in the chat or please raise your hand if you're happy to speak and tell us verbally. Um, we're just wondering for each of you, what project or research idea has brought you here today? Um, what are the types of research questions that you're trying to answer in that research project? You don't have to answer all these questions, but we're just trying to understand a bit more what it is that you're thinking about in terms of research that has brought you to this workshop. So what are the types of research questions you're thinking of answering? Um, what types of data are you working with? Why are you thinking potentially coding? And perhaps you already have an idea of what types of coding you're planning to use. So again, you don't have to answer all of them. You can feel free to put it in the chat or to raise your hand, but we just wanted to um, get a bit of discussion going on the, on the different projects that people might be using coding for. Um, Zoe, thank you for starting it all off. We've got internal and external factors influencing fisheries landings in the Northern Isles using newspaper articles. Yeah, so that sounds like it could be quite appropriate for a coding approach. Um, Morgan, please go ahead. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, it's easy if I talk. Um, not long ago, I did uh, my master's thesis using sort of, I, I'm from biology, so I, I'd never done coding before. 
and it was sort of my first dip, dipping my toe into coding. And uh, I stumbled upon grounded theory and I was like uh, researching about it and trying to apply it. And so by the end of the project, I had realized that what I had applied was nowhere near what grounded theory was supposed to be. And so anyway, that whatever time passed and, and now uh, for the workshop, I was reading uh, something, I can't remember where it was written, but it's just about critiquing um, uh, grounded theory. And it very much applied. I was like, yes, that's exactly, yes, that's what I found. And so it was just a critique of my work, basically. I felt very attacked. And so I'm here to try and learn something, a uh, better way of approaching future work. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, I think in today's workshop, we're not gonna go into the theory too much. It's a bit more of a practical session on how, what flexible coding is and then how to apply it. But you're certainly right in thinking that flexible coding is an alternative, really, to grounded theory. It's still, you know, I don't want to say it's because origins in it, but it um, it tries to turn to make systematic a method that is not grounded theory for coding. So hopefully, it's exactly what you're looking for. Um, Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Paula, for your contribution. So Paula is using qualitative interviews to learn more about local ecological knowledge within the fisheries communities in the UK and how it can be acknowledged more within UK management and policies. Again, that sounds like hopefully, again, that's something that coding should be useful for, as Liliana will outline in a minute. That's quite a similar um, method to what we're using in the ROC project as well. Um, Yeah, great. Um, it's really good to hear uh, people's different work and the different experiences. Uh, thanks for your comments, Morgan. Um, and yeah, it's very well. similar to what we're working on in Rock. So uh, I think we should probably move on. Is that all right, Ian? Yeah, absolutely. But I just, everybody keep reading the chat because there's lots of great stuff coming in. <laughs> saying earlier I'm having a little bit of lag advancing slides so um thanks for everyone's patience um so this session is really intended for those with uh, a basic understanding of qualitative data and qualitative analysis and like we said it focuses on the qualitative analysis method of flexible coding um, so whether you're working with interviews, newspapers, archival data, policy texts, or other records, um, and then whether you're coding for the first time or just looking to refresh and learn about newer coding methods, um, we hope you'll find today helpful. And so the objectives are to understand the purpose and the steps of flexible coding, um, assess the usefulness of flexible coding for your own research. So this might be a really appropriate method, um, but it might also be just something that you draw from or remain aware of as you continue in your work. Um, that we practice, practice collaboratively developing a code book, um, practice using flexible coding to identify themes and data, and then finally learn a few strategies for managing and documenting collaborative processes. Okay, um, so we'll spend a few minutes on what flexible coding is. Um, so flexible coding, it's a qualitative coding method developed by Detterding and Waters um, and initially used to look at recovery and resilience following 2005's Hurricane Katrina in the United States. So it was proposed from a marine social sciences context in sociology. Um, and there are three main aims that it achieves. So first, uh, this is really relevant to the comment from earlier, it is realistic about the fact that researchers come in with preconceived ideas about their analysis. So that means that um, rather than taking a purely grounded approach to the data and only letting themes emerge from it, um, really almost always we have specific questions potentially specific typologies or concepts from the literature um, or practical aims out, 
outlined in the um, research and impact proposals that guide our analysis. And so um, that's important for marine sustainability work, which often has um, policy or other applied aims. And so flexible coding allows us to be honest um, about that we're actually taking a blended approach where we have both preconceived ideas. And so we come in with a, a deductive analysis approach um, as well as leaving space and room for that emergent or inductive analysis to happen. Um, and so that's sort of flexible coding's response to grounded theory that as nice as grounded theory sounds um, in today's research context where we have proposed activities, we've already proposed uh, topics that purely grounded theory isn't, isn't really realistic. Um, second, it advances transparency and qualitative coding, providing clear documentation of your coding strategy for rigorous reporting and publications, um, which I think for marine sustainability work, uh, which sometimes is interdisciplinary, can be really important. Um, if you're having reviewers that are more grounded in quantitative work and wanna see um, what they understand as the same level of rigor in reporting on qualitative work, um, the more transparent, the more documentation you have behind that process, the better. Um, and then finally, it's called flexible because it allows for a reanalysis of data with different topics or research articles in mind. Um, because qualitative coding is a cumulative process where the analysis evolves as interviews are coded, the coding that you do early on can sometimes strongly determine um, like the conceptual direction of your analysis and create, almost create a sort of path dependence. Um, and so flexible coding uh, proposes this two-stage deductive and inductive process that helps avoid that path dependence um, such that one initial story in the data doesn't prevent other stories from being identified and reported on later. Um, so that's a little bit of the theory behind uh, why flexible coding matters for us. Um, and then a little bit more practically, um, flexible coding recognizes that qualitative research projects are becoming larger and more collaborative. Um, so, you know, if you're working on a PhD, you might be the only person coding your data. Um, but for other research projects, they can be a lot bigger. So for example, Detterding and Waters applied this method on um, data sets of 125 interviews all the way up to 450 interviews. So when you're getting um, into projects that are that large, you're definitely gonna have multiple people working um, and needed a way to manage and structure that analysis. So this method is well suited to projects that are a little bit larger in scale. So um, maybe 30 or more interviews. Um, it's good for semi-structured or structured interviews or other um, pieces of data that might have some structure, some uh, common elements to them. Um, like we said, it's also good for collaborative research teams. It's great for descriptive research questions and those with practical aims um, where the topic of analysis is very clear. And um, finally, if you're using modern, well, it really tries to take advantage of modern qualitative data analysis technology like in vivo. Um, so some, some coding processes can be very akin to like a digital a post-it note exercise if, like you would do if you were printing out your uh, data and manually coding. Um, flexible coding aims to take full advantage of the tools that are available in software like InVivo um, and kind of push qualitative analysis into um, the, modern, the modern tools that are available. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask if you could um, either unmute yourself or put in the chat, what's the size of the data sets that you're planning to work with? Um, can you say how many interviews you're going for, or how many units of analysis you're going to be looking at?
Me one. <laughs> okay, let's see. So 20 to 30 um, from LE across different case studies, great. 30 to 35. 15 to 30 interviews, five to 10 focus group sessions. Um, and then Zoe looking at more than 1,000 articles, which is quite a bit. Um, great. Thank you. Yeah, so I think it's a good point to uh, bring up that, of course, the longer the interviews, the longer the analysis will take. And so when you're thinking about this workload, um, and how to manage that analysis. It's actually not just the number of interviews or focus groups, whatever that may be, but also how detailed, how in-depth, and how, um, how long are they? All right. Thanks, everybody. OK, um, so just as a quick example, um, in the Rock project, we're using flexible coding um, on about 30 interviews with marine decision makers. And so there are very clear research topics around um, how decision making happens and practical objectives around how to improve those decision making processes. Um, there are multiple work packages, but for, for one of them, for example, we have three researchers analyzing this data pool of approximately 30 interviews, and we're using in vivo. Um, and so this uh, flexible coding has also been used in other marine social science studies. Um, one of them is on marine tourism and alternative livelihoods in Indonesia. So um, this is something that seems to be gaining a little bit of traction um, from sociology and into marine social science. And if this is something that you take forward, we'd love to hear um, whether it works for you and maybe if there's a way that we could adapt it for our specific context. All right, thanks Liliana. Um, so as, as we said before, a huge part of today's workshop is also about getting hands-on with data and giving the coding a go, because I think um, obviously we need rigor and systems to how we do coding and at the same time it's so important not to get overwhelmed by thinking about how to code and then not actually get to the point of trying to do some coding um, in the first place you know both in, in our research but also in um, learning about coding I think we can we can sometimes almost spend too long contemplating and questioning and sometimes it's through the process that we start to understand and um, have to finalize our method but anyway with flexible coding, there are really two key stages. Um, there's the first stage of index coding and then the second stage of analytical coding. And so in today's session, what we're hoping to do in two breakouts is first have an index coding breakout session where we can all practice doing that stage, come back, talk about it, look at analytical coding in a bit more depth, and then go away and do an analytical coding exercise on the same data. How do we do index coding? Um, the index coding, as the um, figure shows, is working from our research topics or our areas of interest and then applying um, codes that we generate from that to the data set we have. So the first step is to identify what those areas of interest are. Um, one way of doing that in a semi-structured interview data set is to go back to the very questions that you asked in your semi-structured interview protocol and tag the data back to those questions. Um, in the interviews that I've been conducting recently for Rock, that's going to be a really useful step because our STEMI structured interviews have become fairly unstructured. So actually connecting them back to the initial questions of interest that we had is a really useful first step to, to do the index coding and to get that code book of initial codes together. So you identify from your research questions or your um, research topics that you built your research protocol on, um, you, you build a code book out of those, which you see in the little pictogram is the second step, that code book of initial codes. Um, and then you apply that code book to the data. Um, and so in, in essence, what you do when you're coding is you, you tag or highlight a certain piece of text and flag it as being connected to a certain code. And a certain piece of text 
can be connected to more than one code. So even in the index coding phase, it, it could be possible that you think a certain piece of text is addressing more than one of those initial areas of interest or research questions that you were asking. Um, so that's, sorry, that's step three, applying the codes to the data. Now, while you're doing that and you're applying the research ideas that you already had to the data, it's highly likely, and I think as researchers, we really hope that things also come out of the data that we hadn't planned for and that we didn't know the specificities of, or you know, we might have known that we wanted to ask questions about environmental sustainability, but we didn't know what types of examples of that were going to come out. And these things that start to emerge, those interesting things, those unexpected things, those nuances of our questions, those are from, from those, we will form a provisional idea of emerging codes. So they're codes that are emerging from the data set itself. Um, and so some of the benefits of doing this index coding step first um, is again, that in a collaborative process, this is something that can be shared quite easily within a team. Um, you know, both people who've conducted interviews within the team as well as those, as those who haven't can do this step of applying those research themes back to the data. And, it, and so also both those who've done the interviews or collected the data, as well as those who might only be there for analysis, it's a really useful step to get familiar with the data and to start to break it down and understand the different seg sections or subsections that an interviewee or the data um, contains. So I think I'll leave it there for now and I'll skip, I'll jump to the next step of the analytical coding. So at this stage, you've done the index coding, you've applied codes that drew from your research topics, and now you flip, flip the table round and you, instead of starting with the research topics, you start with the data. Um, so you've already done the index coding. I think we can have a discussion later about whether you've done it for all your data or you've done it for some, and then you start to do analytical coding for that data. That's something that might depend on your research project. But let's say you've done the index coding, and now you really want to dig into those more surprising themes, those things that you hadn't anticipated in your research protocol, the things that surprise you. And so you really start doing inductive coding from the data set itself. Um, again, I think there's variation. You can either do it only to the data that you've coded um, with the index coding, so that you've already got a reduced size data set. But some people choose to do the analytical coding for their whole data set again. And again, that's something we can discuss the pros and cons of later. But as you're doing that process, you do want to, again, develop a code book where you keep track of um, the code and its definition and where it applies, you know, what does it apply to. Um, and at the end of that process, you can then really start linking those codes back to your original research questions. And as Liliana pointed out earlier, what's really useful about this step is rather than becoming path dependent and getting really interested in one emergent code and then following it down a rabbit hole and forgetting that there are all these different directions you could go in, one way to structure the analytical coding is to do it per um, a topic that you're interested in. So you don't have to necessarily do all the analytical coding in one go. You could say, we know we have this specific paper we want to write on this topic, or we know we have this specific research question that we're looking for an answer to. And you could do the analytical coding specifically to answer that question or to understand that theory better, and then go back later and do it again for a different topic, which is another um, really cool benefit of the flexible coding process that because it speeds it up, you can do it multiple times. And I think the other thing to highlight is that flexible coding emerged as a method from researchers saying, really, people are already doing this. They're already blending inductive and deductive coding, but we need a system that explains what's going on. So you might find as you're listening that you're like, oh, but I already do that. And that's OK. Um, what we're hoping today is just share a bit more of a framework that can steer um, how, how, you, how you're doing that coding process and also how it can be done collaborative, corrupt, can't speak collaboratively if you're working with other researchers within your team. Great, thank you, Seen. Um, and then I just wanted to add, uh, so if anyone has never coded before, is just starting out, um, a code book can be a very simple um, table of 
code and then the code's definition. And that code can be as simple as a word or um, as complex as a whole sentence sometimes describing you know, what's going on in the code or what's going on in the data. And that just depends on um, your concepts, how you want to work with the data. That's a very personal decision, especially early on. Um, but so the code book, it's, it's not super complicated. It's just um, here's the code and here's what the code means. Uh, okay, see if we can advance that. All right. Um, so we are now going to practice stage one, which is index coding in a breakout session. Um, and we're going to be working with a transcript um, from an interview about subsistence fishing lifestyles among native youth in coastal Alaska. Um, so we're going to go into breakout groups of three or four people. And once you're in that room, um, if you could visit that SharePoint folder that I shared with you this morning, and then click the document that matches your room number, um, that's going to be the collaborative interface that we're going to use to code today. Um, so we ask that you read the sample research backgrounds and research questions, and then use that to spend about five minutes developing an initial code book. Um, so this is our practice taking um, the, those predetermined concepts and turning those into those initial index codes. Um, and then we suggest the remaining 15 minutes of the breakout session using those codes to deductively code the transcript. So you'll be reading through the transcript and trying to find portions of text that might match those um, initial index codes that you've come up with. Um, so just a couple of notes. At this stage, there's, there's no right or wrong for index coding, um, but it's really normal for those index codes to be potentially a whole paragraph. So it can be really, really large chunks of text. It doesn't necessarily need to be line by line um, or sentence by sentence at this time. And then to code the transcript, we suggest using um, a comment to assign a code or an idea to a sentence or paragraph. Um, so that's the sort of capability. You can also use track changes or any other indicator in Word that works for you. Um, but we're doing sort of low tech, software free, um, collaborative coding in this breakout session. So um, you don't have to get through the whole thing. Uh, Seen and I will visit different rooms and then we'll automatically return together um, in about 20 minutes. I might bring us back in 18 minutes um, just to keep us on time. But we will send you to breakout groups and then um, just in the chat, is there anyone who's not able to access the SharePoint folder. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we'll send you into the rooms now and then um, just feel free to message if you have any issues. Hopefully it will be. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome back everyone from, from the breakout session number one um, on index coding. I was just saying, um, I know it's a challenge to take a research background that isn't your own um, and use that to construct a code book, but hopefully the exercise was instructive and in kind of walking you briefly through that process of um, taking the concepts that you know that are part of your research question and your body of knowledge um, and turning those into index codes. So, um, we just wanted to open up the floor and um, ask how that was for you, um, including what codes did you identify, um, what was difficult or challenging about it, and then if you started getting a provisional idea of some of the emergent themes that might be coming out. Do we want to go round by group maybe and invite each group to offer some reflections? Yeah, that's a great idea. Because um, I know room one was doing some excellent work when I dropped by. <laughs> so I'm sure they've got some things to share. Sorry, group one for dobbing you in. 
I don't know if you want to go, Ellie, or if you want <laughs> like you have some more useful insights than me. I feel like if you go first, Lorna, okay. it's because I I've done a little bit, I've done some thematic coding before. So I feel like your perspective is probably more useful. Um, <laughs> um so the index codes, um, I think we kind of just used what was already in the table before and like translated that back over. Um what did I find challenging? I think, um, and like Ellie and I were kind of discussing um, like how rigid you need to be in terms of like whether, like, does it relate? Like, is it slightly different to the code? Um, like how flexible are you supposed to be there? Is that a whole nother code? Um, I think that's what I found challenging. Um, I felt like I needed to read it a few times to kind of um, really get my head into it as well. Um, I don't know if we came up with any emergent themes, um, maybe a cultural one. I think we, the reason we had that discussion like around the flexibility was because we were both kind of like, oh, some of this is like social identity, but also some of it is like cultural, like yeah. behaviors and cultural norms. And I think if, it was me doing that properly I probably would end up almost having sub codes or, or a bit more detail for that section that we had um on on that but then yeah that's what we were chatting about about how you can kind of depending on how you're doing it um how what program you're using or whatever you can kind of write all those I mean that's what I do <laughs> write all my thoughts down and then have to deal with this kind of jumble of of thought but um that's yeah yeah, so that's what we were talking about a little bit. That sounds really good. Thank you for sharing. I think the the question or the discussion you had around rigidity is probably something that all coders discuss. I think, you know, there's always going to be coders who are on the side of being really precise and excluding anything that's a borderline case and or, you know, being very tight in what they code where. Um, and then there's coders like myself and I think Liliana as well, who are on the side of inclusion. So if it looks like it might be within that code, then slap it on. Um, that's the right code for there. And I think also, as I was chatting to people about in a different group, um, with the index coding especially, it is, it is a very broad brush stage. So you don't really want to be leaving, and you don't know your data yet that well, one assumes at this point. So it's probably better in that sense to err on the side of inclusion because if you don't include it, you might not come across it again in future rounds of coding because you've sort of excluded it from that first stage. Um, but again, I think it is personal, but it's really interesting that you already came up with a discussion after 10 minutes of coding. Um, Juliana, is it right if I invite group two to share their answers to your questions? Yes, uh, sorry, did you say group two? Yeah. Yeah. Group two, did you have did you have similar experiences or did you find um I mean did you have the same index codes? What did you have different challenges? Do you want to go, Paula? Yeah, I'm just thinking we were group number two, weren't we? Sorry, I was not. Um so funnily enough, you somehow managed to find a data set that was based in my PhD because I wrote my PhD about geopic salmon fishing in West Alaska. Um so I'm probably kind of um yeah, I'm, I'm maybe not the best person really to talk about it because nothing was a surprise for me. Um in fact it was quite good to know that other researchers basically found the same thing um when it comes to social identity and food and what food processing needs for indigenous people um so yeah maybe the other ones could actually add something to it if you want i mean we put some we, we wrote some codes down and i think we said that lots of i mean wage economy always became up and we talked about modern transport and I think in the list it was it was put down as a driver. However, like just from my field experience, I realized that it can also be a barrier because obviously that means you have to put gas into your um, means of transport, and often you can't afford that um, in the winter times. Um, but I think I mean we didn't. I I at least didn't manage to go through the entire interview, but I didn't really find much on on transport. You guys want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. No. I, no. I was just going to say, uh, 
is, is challenging uh sort of it's a lot in a short time so mm -hmm. we were at the beginning by the end so i just scrolled down and trying to look at the end trying to find something on transport um but yeah it's, it's funny how even in a short time like i read something about um fish abundance or fish running out and i didn't clock it at the time and i didn't put it under the the code that we had written down for stock abundance or whatever and then reading 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 and it's funny how your mind goes through things you've read even when you're reading something else and when i was at the end i went oh, I, i'm sure i read something about this back up there she scrolled up frantically trying to find it as the seconds were counting down but um but yeah it was really fun it's also really fun to hear from other people as well it's the first time i've ever spoken to anyone about doing it no one works with it where i work so thank you for helping me along it's i mean it makes sense that it's challenging because we've thrown a whole sort of research question and the data and the not the codes but um i guess their themes at you that could become codes which is a lot to take in all of a sudden and i think but i think all three groups sorry Ruth, i'll get to you in a minute have demonstrated why perhaps flexible coding is or the index coding is a good way to get to grips with that data really quickly because i think okay maybe nobody's gotten to the end but everybody's been able to start already which is an incredibly fast turnaround for a coding process um oh, there's something else i was going to say about what you said more i'm sorry it's oh um and i hope yeah it's, it's great to hear also that you're enjoying the interaction because i think that's another point again about this method that it does allow for you if you if you have the people around you you can find them um for it to be a collaborative process instead of that very isolated let's spend weeks on end by ourselves with our codes and our data and um you know it's within the rock project we now have a weekly meeting across the whole project to talk about coding and it's the most collaborative project i've ever worked on for coding as well um yeah i think we still have time thankfully for group three did you want to oh, or liliana did you want to add something as well Oh, I just wanted to say coding can be lonely, so it is really, really nice to do it with other people. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Alina, would you like to share any thoughts on group three? Um, yeah, we were um, in our group, in our transcript, we only identified so far two, um, two codes from the, in the code book. Uh, but we talked that some of them are quite broad like social identity similar to group one um it seemed that you can actually kind of unpack that in more detail um i think what i struggled with actually not going along and almost trying to code with the new codes but actually stick to the 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 ones that we have in a code book um but it definitely yeah kind of showed what what else is there as well so you can kind of go with the code book, but then also really see those emergent ideas or or then try to unpack some of the, the ones that you have. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, we were saying that, well, as we were reading the transcript, I came up with like four different bullet points of those provisional sort of emergent codes that I might move on with or try to explore in the next phase of flexible coding. Um, and then I also want to mention that if you're somebody who's used to grounded theory and used to doing a really emergent coding process, um, the index coding part of flexible coding can be a little bit challenging or it can feel really limiting. Um, and that's a discussion that we're actually having in ROC sometimes is like, can we do both of these phases at the same time? Um, or how can we move forward with index coding without also limiting ourselves? Um, but I still think that index coding plays that role of getting to know the data, um, reducing the data potentially by not coding um, completely irrelevant parts of transcripts because a reality, one reality of, of transcripts is that there's sometimes a lot of irrelevant information in the course of a conversation, depending on how um, structured the conversation is. Um, but then also providing that sort of conceptual map or basis from which then you can take multiple, uh, multiple like thematic analyses from. Um, 
And I did, I did just want to share our, I only visited group three, but I just wanted to share um, what this code book looked like. Um, so I think that everyone had a fine time translating the research background we provided and the research question uh, to the code book. So we identified two drivers and three barriers. And I just wanted to make the point that um, in our group, we didn't find uh, weather conditions or decreased fish abundance um, or infrastructure really or transportation um, as relating to the research questions for the index coding process. So we actually found um, this paragraph about social identity. So that's sort of, I wanted to show that you know, these we're, we can be talking about full paragraphs sometimes um, for index coding. Um, this other very large excerpt was also on social identity. And then just at the very end, a paragraph on wage economy. And so that's kind of uh, where we ended up. And um, it's still important to have this sort of framework of index codes because in a whole data set, you might not cover every expected topic in every interview. Um, so just because it doesn't appear in this one interview uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it shouldn't be a code. It might appear in later interviews. Um, and then, yeah, I think the last point was that the social identity code, we talked about as well, that this is a really, really, really broad code. And it might be that some of those provisional emergent codes that we look at in the next phase um, help to specify or um, qualify uh, this broader sort of initial index code. So um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting discussion. Um, Sean, did you have any other thoughts before we go to break? Only perhaps for groups in the next session to start reflecting on how they are collaborating as they're doing it. Like, are you taking conscious choices to talk or not talk? Or are you all coding the same stuff at the same time? Are you splitting the text? It's not a challenge or a wrong or right way. I'd just be interested after the next session to hear some thoughts on how groups have actually gone around the collaborative element of the coding. Great. Um, okay, well, does anyone have any final thoughts or questions perhaps before we go to break? Okay. okay um, welcome back from the break. <clears throat> so we're going to continue on with our practical session um, using the the transcript on Alaska subsistence lifestyles. Um, so now that we've had practice with index coding based on those research questions or the research question, um, we're going to move on to stage two, which is analytical coding. Um, here we're coding inductively to identify themes that emerge from the data that may not have appeared in our initial conceptual framework. And it sounds like based on our discussions, some of us have, um, or through the process of index coding, we got an idea of what those um, emergent codes and themes might be. Um, so you can consider those that you identified and also remain open to um, what might emerge for you as you continue reading the transcript. Um, so as you identify themes and talk with your group about um, what your codes are, you can add them to your code book below the index codes. And in that way, uh, you can start to develop a comprehensive code book describing the data set. Um, so eventually we would use these codes to start conceptualizing articles and um, add to existing literature through our research project. Um, all right. So we're going to go um, back into our breakout sessions for another 20 minutes for analytical coding. Um, so go back into your room's coding exercise document that you might still have up 
and continue reading through the transcripts um, and identify the analytic codes emergent. And so when we come back, um, we will um, talk again about what codes you identified and what you found challenging. Um, and then just seeing the reminder to start thinking about how this is working among different team members. And if this were a broader project, um, how you think you would manage these conceptual discussions. Okay, so we'll see you in breakout room. Um, okay, welcome back. Uh, we hope that was useful, probably also challenging again. Um, so we wanted to spend um, about 10 minutes talking about what happened in that session. Um, primarily, what codes did you identify that you added to your code book? Um, how did they potentially relate to the index codes or to each other? Um, and then if you came across any questions or any problems that you wanted to discuss. Maybe, um, maybe we could start with group three this time, just to change it up. Um, and then we can go in, in reverse order, <laughs> like last time. Um, so I think I will, I'll just start for group three um, and I'll share, I'll share our document. I hope that's okay, Alina. Um, yeah, of course. That's fine. Okay, thanks. So we made it about through, let's see. We kind of only made it through like the first page and a half of the transcript for this analytical coding um, in that time period. But in that process, we identified um, four, four other types of themes um, that we thought were also drivers that the interviewee talked about. Um, so one was um, her understanding of social difference. So she talked about going to college and um, how there she, uh, I guess, whereas before she had gone to college, there were things about her culture or her identity that she took for granted, like how to jar fish or your dad is a fisher. Um, that's what's normal. And there's almost no reason to think about those things. Um, but when she went to college, she experienced a social difference where there were people different from her asking, who are you? And my dad's not a fisher. That's interesting. Tell me about yourself. And what does it mean to be you pick? Um, so we thought understanding of social difference was one code. And um, another was, which is probably related, was introspection or reflection. So not only sort of like the catalyst to recognize that difference, but she talked about her own reflection on what that means. And that um, sort of bolstered in a more intentional way, her understanding of um, how she wanted to participate in her culture. Um, and then a couple on um, having to do with family. So childhood memories and uh, family connections, like connections with parents and grandparents. Um, so those are those are some of the drivers that we came up with, and I think that there's like there's relationships between those. Um, you know, at this point, we're just focusing on coding. So another step in the process would be looking at the codes and understanding how they relate, potentially merging some. Um, but for now, we just ended with those four. Um, and I'm sure that there would be more, but we only made it through about the first page. So yeah, I will go back to the uh, our PowerPoint. I think having spent a few minutes with group two, it's quite interesting because I think there's some overlap. Um, if someone from group two wants to talk about their codes, I, I, I feel like they had different names, but were perhaps identifying similar um, themes. Would you agree? Uh, yes, I can. Um, so our approach was a bit different. We started with discussing um, codes we want to use and then came up with three. So each of us could basically use one code and then apply it to the text afterwards. Um, and there's three kind of codes we came up, themes basically we came up with. Um, 
are kind of yeah similar to group three. So we called the first one being UPIC rather than social identity. Um, but yeah, I guess we mean the same with it, like becoming aware basically of what it means to be UPIC or being indigenous in this case. Um, we got one theme identified as food processing, basically, when in, they talk about how to how to turn fish basically into food. Um, and then the third one we had was intergenerational knowledge transfer or interge intergenerational, um, I guess, relationships. Sometimes it was not really connected to knowledge transfer, but everything that's basically going on between generations. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of overlap there, and I I love the the knowledge that you're able to bring to this exercise with your uh, research background. Um, I also wanted to <clears throat> say I think it's really great how uh, you sort of created a strategy around talking about the themes first, um, which probably requires some familiarity, you know, a certain level of familiarity with the, the transcript and the data, hopefully gained through the index uh, coding process, but then assigning um, one theme to each person. Um, that's definitely one of the suggestions that Detterding and Waters make for analytical coding, because it sort of limits the um, sometimes very tedious cognitive burden. If you're trying to code for all of the analytical codes at once. Um, so I love that you distributed that among, among the team. And then I think, sorry, again, to pick on um, groups and tell them what to say, but group one or room one, you had some really interesting discussion when I dropped by about the process um, of the analytic coding versus the index coding. I wondered if you had any reflections to share with the, the group on that. Would you like to go, Lorna, or should I go? I don't mind. You can go first. I feel okay. like you have some um, good ins. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, really quickly, um, we had very similar codes again, which we kind of took from the social. I think we just worked from when we finished. So we were both a bit like, oh, this kind of fits in social identity, but it kind of doesn't. So we kind of used that to create our emergent themes. So we had um, cultural norms, um, provisioning for family, and, and then knowledge sharing, which I think, again, crosses over a little bit with the other groups. Um, but we, I, I mean, I was just asking questions around um, how do these two bits kind of fit together? Like, um, are we expecting, um, because I think that's what we would we were just working out whether what we were doing was just adding more detail to the index code by creating these subcategories from the data um or were we creating a whole new code like whole new codes if that makes sense so I think that's what I was asking about was um how much of a um distinction are you supposed to be making and and do you kind of present any of that distinction when you show this work to other people like if you're um, writing a paper or presenting this like do you say these are our index these are our emergent or do you just do it all as a big code book um and then yeah and I was saying how I was struggling even though I have thematic coding as is, is what I've done for my PhD and the project I'm working on currently I was struggling to feel like I was coming up with anything when I was reading the script that wasn't just a subcategory or sub related to the index. So I was just talking about that with Sian about whether that's okay. And then you very rightly pointed out that this isn't normal way you do it. Like normally you're doing interviews that you are familiar with because you've either done them yourself or you've done the lit review behind them or you've designed the interview. So this is maybe uh, not to be as, not as stressed, but not to be as hard on yourself because this isn't yours. Um, so that was, I think that was, everything <laughs> Lorna yeah. if you want to add anything sorry just... no no I feel like that was everything um and we were talking about like possibly um trying to work collaboratively with other people and how that will perhaps help you um if you're maybe coming at it with less of a blank slate um you know already have a lot of these themes in your head then that could help as well which I thought was just a really good point to add Thank you. 
Liliana, I think it's over to you. Sure. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to give you space to respond if you had um, anything to say about that. But um, let me look at my notes. I think that there were a couple of interesting things brought up. Um, so first of all, yes, this is a practical sample exercise. So, um, you know, we absolutely never expected anyone to have uh, knowledge about this topic and, and recognize that that's really challenging. Um, so it's more about the process of going through and kind of encountering um, what you might encounter. That said, um, depending on the project and depending on how big the project is, there might be instances where you didn't participate in um, doing the interviews. So um, on the rock project right now, I'm only coding. So I've been coding interviews that I didn't conduct. Um, and that does make it pretty challenging. Um, you know, I, it's still, the transcripts are high quality and I can understand the information. Um, but if you've done the interview, it definitely adds an element of familiarity um, to that process, but that's not always the case. Um, and then I think that the other, the other last thing to say maybe is about how index coding and analytical coding fit together. Um, I consider flexible coding to be one method. So if you're reporting, you could report that you did flexible coding and these were the themes that were identified um, through this coding method. Um, I think that the, the analytical codes can definitely serve to specify or qualify, um, you know, or deepen or complexify some of those index codes, but they might also be unrelated depending on your research context and your data. Um, you know, there might truly be surprises coming out that don't really relate necessarily to the topics that you went in expecting to find. Um, and so in terms of how much of a distinction to draw between the themes or the codes, um, I think it, it depends on your own project, how they happen to be relating within uh, the way that you've done that analysis. Um, but the benefit of index coding is a, a couple of things. Number one, it serves as sort of a systematic map of your data set. So um, you know which topics were covered and which interviews. Are there any major gaps in that coverage? Um, and so you sort of have like a map of here's, here's the content of my interviews. Um, and then that allows that if you do want to come come back and potentially, you know, let's say that uh, as you go through your analysis, you think about a brand new direction or um, you want to go back and, and iterate that analytical coding with different concepts in mind. That flexible coding allows you to do that from the point of index coding rather than having to go all the way back to the beginning and code the entire thing in a new way. Um, so in terms of reporting, I, I don't see these details as particularly um, important relative to the findings themselves. Um, if we're talking about like a research article, for example, uh, where the methodology is usually pretty short, um, but it's also wonderful, I think, to have that information on hand and ready to explain um, the systematic way that you went about that coding for anybody who might have a question about that. Um, Seen, is there anything you would want to add? I think, no, I think you've done a really good job. I think there is just that point about indeed that, okay, a lot of papers probably won't ask for that level of detail, but it is indeed good to keep it as a matter of principle as a researcher to know what you've done and how you've done it. And also indeed for PhDs where, you know, with theses where there is actually a lot more detail often expected in method sections around what you did and why you did it and how you did it. Yeah, I agree. All right. Um, so we just have a few minutes left and I wanted to leave like maybe a couple minutes at the end for final questions if there are any. Um, so I'll try to move through these quickly. Um, just ending with a, a note on managing collaboration. Um, 
So in projects with more than one coder, collaboration needs to be managed to ensure that there is reliability of the analysis and also to distribute the workload. Um, so a Detterding and Waters and their flexible coding paper, they suggest two types of memos to keep track of um, coding and concepts. And in Rock, we've been using just a simple Word document for these memos, but they can also be kept in NVivo, for example, or whatever might work for your team uh, to keep track of concepts as they arise and, and develop within a team. So first, um, respondent memos uh, or you know, news article memos or whatever the unit of analysis is, um, those summarize each piece of text or each interview including the key insights for the research questions. And so this is on the content. What's the content of the interview? Um, it allows coders to see a summary and a reference for interviews that they might not have conducted um, or they might not have coded uh, if you're distributing that work across different team members. So that just, uh, respondent memos just provide a way to communicate across cases and for people to be familiar with the whole data set. Um, the next one is conceptual memos, and this is where the team starts developing notes and ideas about themes across cases, including relationships between themes, um, any exceptional cases, and overarching stories in the data. Um, so conceptual memos are where your articles or papers start being developed, and I think it's worth considering, like, how frequently are we going to meet to talk about this stuff? Um, in Rock, we've been meeting once a month to talk about thematic analysis and development of these ideas in conceptual memos. Um, I, I think that we might start meeting more often than that because it's great to have those conversations. Um, and then finally, we touched on this already a little bit in the session, but um, distributing uh, coding among a team of people. So that can mean that certain people are assigned to um, particular interviews for both indexing and analytical coding. Um, but as we saw with one of our groups, team members can also be responsible for a certain theme or thematic area in analytical coding, whereby they only code all interviews for a limited number of concepts. Um, and we talked about why that might be beneficial already, but it just depends on your data set and your team's needs. Um, but these types of structures are really helpful to think about when you're doing a collaborative project. Okay, um, so that ends. I think we're, we're right on time, which is fantastic. Um, we want to thank you so much for your attendance and input um, and participation in today. And we have like the last three minutes for any questions or final comments um, before we draw attention to a, a quick survey. I think I see something in the chat. Yeah, great. So Seen just added the survey link to the chat. Um, but is there any, any commentary or input or questions that, um, that want to be asked before we close? Can I ask you? Um, could I just, I just wondered if there's a there's people in this meeting who are like going to go and apply this approach. Um, I think, I don't know who's in an SMMR project and who's not, um, but I was just, I would just really like if there was some follow up, um, not event or anything, but some kind of contact where we could, if we needed to chat about this a bit more um, or chat about this collaboratively with some researchers, just um, from my own project, I'm um, kind of on my own um, in a much wider project looking at many different aspects of seagrass restoration. So um, it would be great to have a little bit of um, just some social science buddies essentially to chat about this method or, or look maybe thematic analysis, those kind of things. Um, so yeah, if there's any kind of follow-up that we could do maybe at SMR conference or something like that, I would be keen. So just to be to send up the to the higher up, I guess. <laughs> That's a really good idea. And it's definitely something we can feedback <laughs> and let the SMMR. I don't want to say ivory tower, they're not an ivory tower. Let the SMMR people know. <laughs> Thank you, that'd be perfect.
Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and, and end the session here then. Um, please do, if you have a couple of minutes, fill out that survey. Um, and then you all should have been emailed the slides, but we do have um, a references slide at the end, which contains a couple of other useful papers um, for your reference if you want to learn a little bit more. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. And um, yeah, I hope you have a great week. Thank you. Thank thanks you so, so much. much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. See you. Bye. Have a nice day. Thanks.